I'm James Russell, so I have a pretty picture because, you know, I guess I'm not quite on the apocalyptic side, you know, side of the scale yet. yet. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the architect critic at Bloomberg News, and I've been a journalist in architecture for a long time. Uh, and I explored a lot of the issues that uh, the human howitzer, <laughs> Jim Kunstler, raised in my book, The Agile City. But I'm only going to touch on a couple of them in this very brief introduction because we've got lots uh, to talk about uh, here. So the way that I'm going to approach this is to maybe intersect somewhat obliquely with some of the issues that uh, Jim uh, raised. I think one area on which we agree is that there's a lot of desire to get back to normalcy, whatever that was, you know, at, you know, and given the difficult economy that we're all in. But there isn't really a normal to go back to. Uh, this image, uh, which does sort of suddenly bounce off something Jim did, is a casino that uh, came to an abrupt uh, construction end with the collapse of the economy. Now, actually, uh, some poor bank uh, went ahead and finished it, it very grumpily. Um, but and I hear it's open, but I seriously doubt it's making a cent. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the way I have see the sort of new normal that we're in, which is that we are often described, our, our economy is often described as a consumption economy, and that our economy is based on consumption, the buying of stuff, and that when we buy more stuff, our lives get better. The problem that that consumption model now has is the collapsing US, you know, these uh, things we're all pretty familiar with, foreclosures, and as Arthur C. Nelson argues, five million too many McMansions that we'd have to deal with. So the real question is, the real struggle that we've been going through uh, over the last couple of years is who's going to consume and with what? So the debate in Washington is really just about different methodologies or ideas about how to get people to spend money, i.e. consume, but the, the, there's some real uh, confluence of issues that are make this a little bit difficult to induce, especially in old-fashioned ways. So first of all, this whole question of is the U.S. prepared for the future? Uh, one figure I saw, which I've actually not been able to verify, and Bloomberg is where I work is nothing if not about verifying, uh, is uh, alleged 32 billion disaster losses in only the first half of this year. That was be that had to do with a few floods and a few fires, but does not include Hurricane Irene, um, does not include, only include some of the tornadoes, um, and certainly we don't really even know what the cost of Western wildfires is yet. In fact, interestingly enough, we don't know the cost of those spring floods of the Mississippi. FEMA has not you know, compiled a number, which is rather telling in some fashion. Uh, the flood insurance program, just to give an example, which is supposed to pay for itself, uh, through uh, the money people pay in for federal flood insurance has not been obviously paying for itself. Katrina blew a pretty big hole in it and uh, it already was $17 billion in debt. That debt is actually much larger. I just haven't found what the number is yet. So the whole question is, who, as we contemplate these disasters uh, that have happened and the potential that we might have some pretty bad years ahead of us, who's going to pay? And with what are they going to pay? And where's the will to do the work to keep these disasters from harming us to such a great degree? Uh, so next up is resource wars. Jim, the other Jim, made reference to this. But here we are in an incredibly difficult economic time when America's mo not moving at all, Europe's not moving at all, Asia is moving, but we have record-breaking food prices we have spiking oil prices, okay, we're only seeing a decline now because the economy is looking worse, uh, so, but you know, the upward trend, I think, is uh, it's fairly safe to say will go on, although we could obviously have a debate about what is peak oil and when it is. But we're also seeing other kinds of commodities rise. We're seeing spiking copper and steel prices. If any of you are architects, you're well aware that You've got clients who think they're going to build, you know, they're going to build for a steel because all the contractors are hungry. But you're paying unbelievably high prices for copper and steel, which of course slows everything down again. Um, you see China doing stuff like trying to corner the market on rare earths, the little 
you know, chemicals and uh, mineral resources that we go into our cell phones and whatnot. So what we're seeing is that this resource inflation is stalling our recovery, certainly oil prices do that, uh, and food shortages are spurring riots. They're, you know, it's easy to forget that actually it was food riots which kind of got the whole um, uh, uh, Mideast um, unrest going. Uh, okay. Something Oh. Uh, nature biting us back. We're seeing, um, you know, most of you are probably aware of these things, these kind of declining, really key resources. Uh, so that raises the question of, is an economy based on consumption viable in a resource-scarce world? This is a question we're really not asking. So now I'm going to wait for this. is cooperative. Yeah, yeah, they weren't working. Okay, well, we'll see how we get done. Uh, so that's why I argue when you look at these things taken together, which sound fairly apocalyptic, uh, even in a you know, quiet PowerPoint, uh, you know, the question is what I argue is why will green grow the future? And I think it has to do with the way we look at our economy. The old economy, we use resource, we regard resources as cheap. We regard all those things like fisher, fisheries, minerals, agriculture, forests as inexpensive. And so we don't use them very efficiently. Uh, so we tend to overuse them because they're underpriced, uh, and which results in a higher uh, economic environmental impact, but which also contributes to the shortage economies, the resource scarcities we're seeing. The green economy, I think in a very broad way, can focus us on high resource use efficiency. In other words, regarding the resources as precious and regarding them as something that uh, we have to be careful with and focused on low environmental impact because that begins to address the resource, you know, the, the forest we're running out of, the agricultural land we're running out of. So I argue that agile cities can thrive in a climate change era. Okay, now it's working. Uh, just briefly, a little foray into architecture. Uh, this is Kroon Hall at Yale, and there, I have used it in my book because it has particularly good uh, information about how, you know, they uh, engage, this is pretty close to what counts as the state of the art of green buildings these days, and there are solar panels you can't see, solar heating, you can see the louvers which are cutting the east and west sun, they've oriented the long side of the building to the south, uh, which is not, which is the where the least heat comes, but also you gr could grab it in the winter. Anyway, it's got numerous uh, tactics. And uh, among the interior, which is really quite beautiful, you can see how they balance the daylight beautifully. Skylights that you can't see have uh, solar films on them. The wood you see is actually from Yale's very own forest, sustainably managed. Not all of us have our very own forest, but Yale does. Um, but the point really is, is that for all the tactics used in this building, you see that they got 50% of their energy reduction out of conservation tactics of various kinds, and it cost 2.4% of the building cost. Then they got another 25% of their energy through a solar energy, uh, so through the solar, various solar um, elements, at a rather higher uh, cost for only half the benefit. Uh, and so really the point of this is that where the action is, is in conservation. We've been hearing an awful lot about how renewables are not so great because of the uh, bankruptcy of the Solyndra Solar uh, Panel Company. And so that, uh, the blanket um, indictment is that all of these, re and conservation always gets lumped in with renewables. And I think the point I'm trying to make here is conservation is actually fundamentally different it's fundamentally superior. And what you see in, in a lot of buildings is that the kind of state of the art in green buildings is that we can get two thirds of the way to net zero energy with conservation tactics uh, pretty typically, and we get the rest of the way through the renewables. So if you have expensive renewables, then it actually makes it far more affordable to do the first two thirds with conservation. So to me, that's extremely powerful. But then when you scale it up, 
when you think about communities and what's possible to do on a community level, and then when you think about what's possible to do with infrastructure, and trans especially transportation, uh, what you have is something that is actually very, some, a lot of power that we can bring to bear with not a lot of exotic technology or even a lot of you know, transforming our lifestyles um, into some kind of you know, hair shirt uh, world of living in caves. Uh, but the other you know, powerful advantage of thinking about buildings and communities and infrastructure as the field on which we try to deal with issues like climate change is that they can also address lots of other issues at the same time. Storms, floods, droughts, we can look at, we can shift load demand, we can um, use cogeneration, uh, we can, and of course, lower demand. We can also derive lots of multiple benefits from integrating tactics and assembling tactics together. I won't uh, prolong that. And so, what the other thing I argue, and this is another kind of renewables, uh, and it's certainly also a a against business as usual argument is when you look at what we can do uh, with buildings and communities that we can meet these challenges much more readily because these tactics are incremental. There's, there's hundreds, there were close to two dozen tactics used in Prune Hall alone. On the community level there are many, many more uh, tactics that we can use. Uh, so when you have incremental tactics with many technologies and many ways of approaching things, you have much lower risk. You're not throwing half a billion dollars at one technology. You're not trying to make nuclear safe. You're not trying to find out, you know, throw tremendous resources at clean coal. You, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, that's why, and, but that's kind of what's been going on to the extent anything's been going on. So uh, these ver the other aspect of it is that at the same time, especially if you talk about smart growth or e even the best work that the new urbanists, urbanists have done, part of what the outcome of that is that it makes possible the restoration and reweaving of natural systems. We're not fragmenting the landscape to such a great extent. Uh, we're making it possible for uh, natural systems to operate, you know, in, within and around cities, and that, you know, increases our resilience and our adaptability for the future. Human networks, by which I mean infrastructure primarily, uh, roads, uh, can become more adaptable. The result is that we do build well-being and wealth simultaneously, which the skeptics certainly don't believe we can do, but that was really the case I'm trying to make um, in the book. So the other thing I want to sort of leave you with before we dive into this debate is that great cities have always been agile. Uh, we often think of cities as being very entrepreneurial. It happens to be an image of Hamburg, which of course has been a powerhouse city uh, for hundreds of years. And it's been that because it's a trading city. Uh, it's one of the big, biggest ports in Europe. It's always adapted to whatever the new technologies was, to trading routes, to trading economies, to politics, and now to the environment. It's actually one of the most inventive cities in beginning to cope with uh, climate change. So that's where I kind of leave it before we um, start the, uh, the debate. That's my book. That's some information about me. And take it away. Uh, that, that wasn't quite puppy from science.